<laughs> I gotta get go, kids. Cranky Bill, go, go. <laughs> See, I should just do this first thing before I start thinking about things, like two in the morning. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bill Miller, and today we have Joe Mott. Uh, and so if you've seen some of our other videos and had some customers talk, uh, they keep mentioning mentioning uh, Joe Mott selections. So this is Joe Mott. Hello. <laughs> so we thought we'd say, what are Joe Mott selections? So we brought a few of these today, and, uh, and we'll talk about some of the other stuff that you've got coming up. But let's talk about this and what you brought today and what we're going to start out with. Well... All of them are wines from Spain. Um, all the wines have zero sulfur additions. They're all made with indigenous yeast um, and have uh, no additions. In, in a world of, of artisanal wines and, and natural wines, these are, um, unlike some, the, the real deal. Just what's, that, what's that mean by the real deal? Are well, you trying to go for like purity? Are you trying to go for no additives? Are you biodynamic? You know, I was, I was thinking about this morning, all of the above, I would say. But, um, you know, we're all really used to wines with, with, a, with a blueprint. And I'll, right. I'll just use Rioja as an example. I love Rioja wines. Um, but we, we sort of, we know what we're going to get. And that can be very great. But it's also, um, you know, Michelangelo came along and... and took sculpture to another level. Um, Titian came along and brought painting to another level. And I feel like nowadays the blueprint is fantastic. I love the blueprint, but I, I think that there, there's more. And these for me are, they're more. Can you tell you're into this? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start off with, with, with this one. So this is um, a producer from, it's a, a partnership of uh, man and woman the woman is from uh the region around segovia around rueda and her her partner um jesus is from bierzo um, and their their family lineage goes back multiple generations um and and having vineyards in those areas they worked for um selling your soul type of endeavors uh, and they decided to leave that behind to farm only their family's plots how did you find them just walking through actually through through Samuel. Samuel said, you're going to taste this clarete, which is what we're tasting now. And he said, you are going to, you're going to flip out. And this was before I was like in this relationship of a, of a broker business. This was just me driving around Spain, as I've done for the last 15 years, just wanting to, to meet growers and learn about what they're doing. Um, and so this is from Bierzo. Typically, we know Bierzo as being Mencia and, and red wine. Yep. And they make that, but they also, they have a, a single plot um, that butts up next to a church. It's one hectare. And when I, when I looked at this, when I, well, actually, when I was walking in the vineyard, I saw white grapes, red grapes, some kind of pinkish, pinkish gray grapes, similar to, to Pinot Gris. Right. And I said, Esmeralda, what, what do we have going on here? This is obviously not going to turn into Mencia. And she said, Jill, this is Milraza. She'll taste it shortly. And it was, um, it is a, a compilation of, there is Mencia in here, but there's also Garnacha Tintorera, there's Palomino, there's Doña Blanca, there's Chelva, which is a, each grape is about this big. Um, so people usually just toss it into a lot to make uh, cheap white wine. She says, it's in the vineyard, why don't we just put it all together? Um, and there are, are, are many other grapes as well, a total of 12. And then okay. it's aged in uh, local chestnut. And it's a, a wine that we find when you smell it, you people don't know what to make of it. And they can't believe that, fine, it's from Spain, but from Bierzo, really? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, wear the Bierzo tag because for right now, um, they, they want Bierzo, the denomination of origin, to pay more money to, uh, f for grapes, um, have the, the grape growing price uh, for farmers higher. So they're, um, for now, not uh, subscribing to the Bierzo Dio. What's the, there's a little sour component. What's that come from? It's like if you ever had um, um, cranberry juice in that sure. back of the palate, the, and it makes you want to drink more. They harvest um, a little bit earlier than most. 
but they harvest their grapes with a quite a, an incredible amount of acidity. So instead of you having a really delicious, beautiful wine, but that might be a little bit flabbier, this is um, this is quite acidic and mm -hmm. and makes you want to to go back for the next the next sip. And the fact that this has uh, no sulfur added, I I can't believe it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So this is a um, the first person that I met on on the, the I wasn't brokering at the time but when I met him we immediately hit it off I couldn't believe how pure his wines are yet um, without any sort of context they don't have a sister or a brother like wine um, in Spain or in the world for that matter but he is um, he's from La Mancha and he makes this is a hundred percent of a grape called Tinto Velasco and this is his his rosé, and it spent six months in chestnut, Spanish chestnut. So they're big on chestnut. Yeah, you know. Is um, it predominantly grown? It is. Some people think it's kitschy, um, which maybe it is, but for them it's less expensive than oak, um, and it grows, you know, for the most part locally in Spain, so why, why use something else? I had a couple of sommeliers in town um, say, instead of saying vinos patio, because people automatically think patio pounder or something. Um, <laughs> they want to call it sommelier crack juice because they... But that's much better. <laughs> that's patio, <laughs> for sure. What do you think? I, I love it. I love the light fruit notes. Um, now, so I'm a big acid uh, person. And again, is that what we're going to see along these entire lines? Absolutely. It seems like a theme with you. Which when, I love, by the way. So yeah, yeah, and and the wines need to have a certain amount. If they're not going to have sulfur additions, they they best have a lot of other components that are going to help the wines travel safely, remain lively. And if people do decide to, I mean, this is a 2015, so this is his current vintage rosé. Right. But it's by no means, um, a, you know, a recent vintage yet. It's screaming with acidity. So I know these aren't like age. You're not going to lay these down because they're so freaking delicious but <laughs> um how long would they last the you think rosés you got to drink them that season it's like a seasonal thing everybody gets their rosés and you drink them all up and then they're gone yeah and that's um, a really good question and i'm still learning with the wines too i, I think that with the mil razas i tasted the last vintage of it um a, a short while ago right. and it was beautiful it was delicious but i would want to drink it within the next year the patio rosé i feel like it's a a good year and then you'll want to buy the next vintage right so real no benefit it's not going to change that much it'll definitely um Doesn't evolve in the bottle but it's okay. not and it's going to get a little more interesting but it's not necessarily going to be like an age-worthy wine where you would say i want to set this down for eight months plus kind okay of thing. Gotcha. So. all right which one are we going to next this next wine is some was um first time making this red wine it's called payaritha and payaritha is a in reference to the stone walls, that, that right. line of vineyard. And the, the little caveat on the bottom says, lo que el granizo no se llevó, like what the hail didn't take with it. And he sometimes will elaborate, uh, put Tinto Velasco on its own. Um, and here, because hail took ravaged 80% of his Tinto Velasco, he sprinkled in a little Syrah, a little Graciano, okay. um, a little Petit Verdot, which his father actually had planted um, back when it was cool to plant new French varietals um, and aged in cement. What you'll notice with these three wines is, um, and nobody ever talks about this, but we know the cliffs of Dover. Right. They, they come down under the, the channel and they come back up. We see them in, in sh the soils of Chablis. We see them in the soils of Champagne. They go back down and they up upcrop in Jerez, in Alvariza. Um, Alvariza soils, which maintains a freshness to, to um, Jerez. Nobody talks about, there's an outcropping in La Mancha, very small, but literally in, in the vineyards that this comes from, you wipe away the topsoil less than a half a centimeter and you're at limestone bedrock, which is why wines that from such a hot area with, in this case, a, just a, a excessive amounts of skin contact can be so fresh. This is um this is a wine, the Payarita, is a really cool red that uh, most of Samuel's wines, not all of them, but most of them, day one they're delicious. Day two, they're really cool. Day three, 
you start to wonder how can wines last this long? And again, not all the wines, but this And this was, is open sitting on your counter. This is open sitting here at Sunfish. We did a tasting a couple days ago. Um, on Look at that, she did a plug for us. A plug, That's why not? <laughs> uh, we did a tasting on Saturday of the new wines and they um, we had a half a bottle left and I thought, you know, why not pour it today and, and share it with you, see what you think. So when you know when you have a port, a 20 year port, and you drink it, it's fruity, it's nice, and then all of a sudden that rush of nuttiness comes. Mm -hmm. That's what I just got out of this. Why is that? There is a little bit of, of, of nuttiness. It's a little bit of, um, I get a little bit of like that, a lot of people will call like it like you just a, lick the outside of a nut. Well, this is a great conversation um, that could, I don't think. I don't get that a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a difference between, there's a difference between like a nuttiness, and then there's a difference between there is a, a mousiness that people will say can be a fault in wine. And I don't get that here. Um, some of his wines do display a nuttiness due to the fact that they have such excessive skin contact um, okay. that a couple of incredibly natural and amazing honest winemakers in the Rhone have talked about when a wine that has a lot of skin contact gets bottled and then it gets shipped to us and we uncork it, the air contact with that wine will produce some flavors that we're not used to and in some cases not in this wine but um it like there's a there's a mousiness that i don't like in wines um and but it's a similar compound uh that we're we're realizing that due to oxygen can be present um but in this case that nuttiness i get green there's a little bit yeah, of a bitterness yeah. for sure um and that comes to the that comes from the fact that um it is, I think it is a rustic wine. Uh, I've had a couple buyers tell me, Jill, this is so cool. I think it's so fantastic. It's a I little like rustic. It. I said, have you ever been to La Mancha? It's like- It's very rustic. Desolate, dried bread salads and super simple gazpacho. Um, I think it's extremely interesting. Mm. I didn't say fantastic. I said, there you go, it's working. Um, All right, okay, where should we go? Let's go this, one? let's go this way. So, um, and I'd love to hear what you think because not a lot of people have tasted these wines. For example, um, the first five that I've I've poured, or the first four that we've mm -hmm. poured, and this guy, are only available in Minneapolis and Chicago. This guy's only in Minneapolis and at very few places because there's such little production. We're talking about, you know, sixty plus cases produced in the world. Right. Um, so, but there's also not a lot of volume going on here. A thousand bottles produced. This is this is uh, upwards of about fifty cases produced okay. for the world. So when people say it's a two thousand case production, it's low production. I don't. This is low. This is that's low production. Yeah. I think a thousand bottles are low production too. So this guy here um, is is strange to say the least. Um, and this is when I when I'm talking about the the Michelangelo or the, the Titian or things like that. Um, Samuel will be the first person to say he's experimenting, he's trying to harness terroir, but he, you know, we go to these natural wine fairs around the world and people are doing two years of skin contact, aging it and flipped upside down ceramic concrete containers. And mm. you say to yourself, and they say, they toot, this is not ceramic and cement, the two different things, but they'll say, you know, I'm aging it in, in foreign vessels that I haven't, I'm not used to aging it in, and this is my terroir. And you wonder, well, you've been making wine for 10 years and you're using all these different, how can you, how can you use the T word? And someone is the first to say that he's trying to harness it. But I mean, if you look at the terroir right now of La Mancha is insipid, three euro a bottle white wine it's not uh four months of skin contact age in american oak right i mean the color you just automatically thinking i'm gonna get a madeira or something yeah and the smell is i've heard anywhere from um like a liqueur to dessert wine yeah someone told me the other day caramelized apple skin some my mother who doesn't drink mm -hmm. wine said it smells like snicker bars great but it, um, it does have a, a, a sweet aroma, but when you taste it, it is bone, bone dry. Um, and in an attempt to, to find the raciness that is La Mancha, the rusticity, and the tannin will help with, with something uh, of chewy proteins. And this is just a testament to this is what's going on in the world today. 
Um, the blueprint is exciting and it's 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 beautiful, but it isn't. How often is it mind blowing? How often does it make us consider? It is so drastically different. It's not something that I would pour and hang by the pool or mm -hmm. um, later in the evening with dinner. I mean, seriously, with it with a steak is a great analogy with this. This is very interesting. And so I know the looks of it, and I'm trying to get away from the word orange, but I'm getting a lot of that. Yeah, and I think that that's really fair. It is a, it is wine, a white wine made with skin contact, and it renders a, a copperish, mm -hmm. orangish wine. So I mean, I know it's a catch-all nowadays, but it, it's it's honest to use that for sure. I really like that. That's good. And and to just talk about this because. People will ask what this is like, and I don't open it often because it. There are 18 bottles in the entirety of the United States, and six We're not of worthy. them. What was that? We're not worthy. We could, but there are only <laughs> six. Of, only six of them are here. Um, but it's from a, a an amazing uh, couple of sites that someone makes 300 magnums of this wine, and it resembles this Entre Aires. It's leaner because it's a blend of instead of being all Aiden, it's Aiden and Vigiriega. Uh, but a joy to drink, and just like this, incredibly surprising. Um, I couldn't help bring in, uh, you know. And so this is a popular grape. I didn't, it is. It's, a, it's, it's one of the most widely planted grapes in the world. I think it is. I think it's like twice the next one going. So we, and we never hear about these grapes. We hear Chardonnay, we hear Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. We don't hear about this. It's usually made it's into, in yep, it's, and it's mostly made into juice that's either sent to distill for brandy, right, which is the majority of it, or it just it's made for a coiffer in the the worst wine outlets in Spain, and then you know not to, but not to poo poo it and look at what people are doing with it. Well, so seven hundred fifty thousand acres of it makes it the wide, most in the world widely planted grape. We never hear about it, but it's also mostly all of it is in Spain. Correct. correct? Okay. Yep. Well, well, last but not least, we'll go to uh, the mountains of Asturias. Give a little rinse here just because the previous wine is so intense. So uh, this gentleman here, Nico, um, is making some wine in Asturias in an in a area that is by and large known for its cider production. And there's a, there are a small couple of valleys that, since the 11th century, I believe, um, have been growing grapes and making wine. And Nico is the only one. People say there's natural wine around Asturias, and there are people using indigenous yeasts for sure. Nobody's doing no sulfur. Nobody's doing um, little to no temperature control. All indigenous yeasts, not filtered or fined, and. Um, Nico's had his water turned off. He's had his electricity turned off by local growers by lo because he's the only one doing this type of wine, and he's, he's getting pretty well known for it, which, is, which he deserves for sure. This is a blend of Albarín Blanco, mm -hmm. of no relation to Albariño, and then Albillo. No relation. Correct. Um, and Albillo. And many people that love... Uh, Premier Cru Chablis, like just a touch of oak. This has a, a very short amount of time in old French oak. Or they like Muscadet. Love this because it is a little bit lazy, but it's incredibly um, acidic in a good way. Easy to drink, easy to understand. I mean, at the same yeah. time, if you want to think about it, you can give it its due diligence for sure. No, it, it was. it's like um, the, the nose is very different from what you think you're going to taste, though. I agree. And these, the Fanfaria wines, um, along with the other wines from Nico, they are wines that I, I would comfortably lay down. Um, this is the, the least expensive wine he makes, and it, um, I have a few in my cellar because I'm curious with all that acid and that little touch of structure right. that the, the barrel um, leaves. I think it'll, right. it's got I a couple so years ahead of it for sure. It's funny, this, the, the nose of it, Makes me think it's going to be like like an Albarino, like it's going to be a little bit more body to it, mm -hmm. a little bit heavier weight, um, and then it, you get none of that. It's just light, lively, citrusy. This is a really nice one. In 2015, um, is was a was a warmer vintage mm -hmm. throughout many places in Europe, and when you taste the 2015 Fanfaria, it is more generous, and that's what I love is you can 
you can taste vintage variation in the wines, which I, I think is a boon. If if people are buying wines because they don't want to, you know, because they want to travel through a bottle, right? Why not take with that the good and the bad? You know, I hesitate to to accept uh, the the phrase Smart. "go after." <laughs> Only because I tend to, they tend to, I find them and they find me and I don't have any sort of, um, when I visit them, I don't necessarily visit them with an agenda. I, I just want to experience. So are you wandering around, you're tasting the wine and then you have to figure out who's making this and then go see them or are you just, I mean. I usually will just either show up or email a producer and say, hey, I'm, I'm in town, may I stop by and taste through your, your stuff and because they're so small and a lot of them aren't in the exporting business per se, they'll mm -hmm. say, uh, well, um, text me when you get here. And I just have to hope for the best, right. um, which has happened with, with these folks. And and so now you have a trip coming. Um, I know we tried to squeeze this in before you left. Yeah. Uh, where are you off to next? In three days, I leave for the Republic of Georgia for the second time. Okay. And, well, you have some wines from there as well. So are you looking for new stuff to... So those wines, I actually don't, um, I don't import or broker. I actually make very little money on those wines, if any, but it all just comes from um, the heart. It is, people say, you know, if you had 30 minutes to speak with someone, who would you speak with? Right. And Jesus Christ, Abraham Lincoln. For me, I just want to be able to speak with the wine, the genesis of wine. It's, I mean, it's an incredible feeling to be there. Uh, so I can't wait to go back. Wow. Well. Fantastic. You're definitely not into, uh, you're, it's a passion, let's just put it that way. For sure. <laughs> for, nobody's going to get rich in this business, that's true. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank, Jill, thank you for coming. Thank um, you. Thanks for sharing these. I can't wait to see what you bring back, and we'll do this again. Absolutely. All right. Sure. Thank you.